Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I know you've had uh, two very full days and some excellent sessions, and you're probably dying to get away. <laughs> so the longer I go on, the more you're going to be cursing me. <laughs> so uh, let me say what I have to say, and I'll try and say it as, as quickly as I possibly can. Um, a few years ago, I got a lovely letter from a seven-year-old kid, and in it there was a 50-year-old note. And he said that he had just made his first communion, and he wanted to share the money he had collected with children who were less fortunate than himself. I thought that was, he got a really nice letter back. <laughs> but I mention it because it is so unusual. Of the tens of thousands of children who make their first communion and confirmation every year, perhaps only a handful would even consider uh, sharing what they had collected with, with others in need. So what I'd like to talk about uh, this morning is that parents who try to transmit values of empathy, compassion, and solidarity to their children today face an uphill battle. As the values that are embedded in our Western societies are in many ways the exact opposite of empathy, compassion, and solidarity. And these values are imposed on us by the economic system in which the Western world has embraced. I'd like to focus just on three of those values, which are particularly destructive of compassion. First, a destructive virus has corrupted our societies, and it's called rampant individualism. It was introduced quite deliberately by the advocates of the neoliberal model which underpins the global economy. Then it became widely entrenched in our culture and mindsets, and has even spread to our churches and their dominant spiritualities. Rampant individualism believes that those who succeed economically do so because of their hard work, dedication, and self-sacrifice exclusively. Those who fail to succeed economically do so because they are lazy, irresponsible, and seek only short-term pressures. So why, ask those infected by this virus, why should people pay higher taxes to pay for hotel accommodation for homeless families, or for drug treatment services, or for long-term uh, unemployment uh, welfare payments? This only allows uh, irresponsible people to continue behaving irresponsibly and sponge off the street off the state. These supports should be withdrawn or at least left to charities and do-gooders who will no doubt return in the evening to their comfortable homes feeling good about themselves. And those people now supported by the hard-working taxpayer should be forced to lift themselves up by their shoelaces. Why don't homeless people go out and get a job? I am constantly asked by people who are unaware that some homeless people do have a job, but are still homeless. Of course, some people who have not succeeded by the definitions of society are exempt from this stigma. We divide people into the deserving poor and the undeserving poor, where the deserving poor are often those who are like us, and the undeserving poor are them, as distinct from us. So rampant individualism has made our societies very judgmental. Suggestions that many who are homeless, are unemployed, are on disability benefits, are simply scamming the system, are regularly heard, even from some decision makers. Our about to be uh, 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 Taoiseach launched a campaign highlighting the abuse of the social welfare system and in the process, grossly exaggerating the extent of welfare fraud. But it confirmed the widespread impression that many have that many social welfare recipients are on the fiddle. It could, of course, have highlighted the fact that tax evasion deprives the exchequer of hundreds of times more money than social welfare fraud. Last year, a landlord was discovered to have evaded income tax 
to the value of 1.14 million. He settled with the revenue for just over 3 million, including interest and penalties. He was not prosecuted. He was not jailed. He has a clean criminal record. Last year, a father of three who committed 25,000 euros worth of social welfare fraud appeared before the courts. The judge described it as a serious offence, but accepted that the defendant was highly unlikely to do it again. He acknowledged that the defendant lives in, quote, pretty poor conditions and lives a pretty miserable life, unquote that he has only minor previous convictions and had cooperated with the Garda investigation. Nevertheless, quote, the court must give a message to the general population that you will pay a price if you are caught committing social welfare fraud, unquote. He was jailed for 18 months. The previous government's stated justification for reducing the welfare payments of young people under 25 to 100 euros per week was to get them off the couch watching television and out looking for work. Even though at the time, there was only one advertised job for every 32 job seekers. Meanwhile, the government have recently allow, agreed to allow the Bank of Ireland to exceed the salary cap of half a million as it seeks to attract a new chief executive. It reminds me of the observation of the economist J.K. Galbraith the poor do not work because they have too much income. The rich do not work because they do not have enough income. You expand and revitalize the economy by giving the poor less and the rich more. This mindset that people get what they deserve as a result of their efforts and talents has become widely entrenched. During our Celtic Tiger years, this mindset dominated the political and tabloid media discourse. We had full employment. Hundreds of thousands of non-Irish were coming into this country to work. So if someone failed to take advantage of this opportunity, they have only themselves to blame. Why should we hardworking, get ahead people express any empathy with those who are too lazy or unwilling to go out and get a job? The role of birth, chance, and old-fashioned luck is deleted from our reasoning by this virus. During the Celtic Tiger years, the word solidarity, meaning we should share the, share the benefits uh, with those who have been left behind, was absent from the political discourse. People's focus was on getting ahead, getting onto the property ladder, building up their assets. Building a sense of community was an optional add-on for those who are so inclined. People had no time to get to know their neighbours. People didn't want to get to know their neighbours. And people didn't see any need in getting to know their neighbours. People were too busy getting ahead to bother with such peripheral issues. We were only reminded of the need for solidarity when the recession came. And then the word solidarity came to mean that the poor must take their share of the sacrifices needed to get us out of the recession. Others believe that one of the inevitable, if regrettable, consequences of economic growth is that there are casualties who cannot compete and get left behind. We have created a throwaway culture where we discard the packaging and everything else that is not needed. Human beings who are not needed by the economy, the unemployed, the homeless, the addicted, are equally discarded and excluded. Those excluded are no longer society's underside or disenfranchised. They are no longer even the exploited, but they are now the leftovers, the cast out. Pope Francis often talks about the globalization of indifference. Some even quote the gospel out of context to justify inaction on poverty and inequality. The poor you will always have with you. 
So the fact that our society is becoming more and more unequal, with the majority of economic growth, benefits of economic growth, going to a small percentage of the population, is considered by many as just a natural state of affairs. In 2010, the richest 388 individuals in the world owned as much wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion. Five years later, in 2015, 62 individuals in the world owned as much wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion. Who today questions the immorality of such a concentration of wealth in the midst of poverty, while one billion people in our country go to bed hungry every night? On the contrary, many admire and respect those who have grown so obscenely wealthy, considering them to be astute, brilliant business people and very hardworking, which no doubt some of them are. But without asking why the CEO of Charter Communications in the United States should be worth a salary of almost $2 million per week. Associated with this value is the belief that what I have is mine. I have earned it, and therefore I am free to do what I want with it. If I choose to contribute to charity, that is my decision, and there is no moral obligation on me to do so. Nor is there any moral fault in not doing so. The ads for the Irish National Lottery remind us that if we play the lotto, we may no, no longer need to go visiting islands in far off places. We can buy one. <laughs> this attitude that what I have acquired legally belongs to me and I can do whatever I want with it was first articulated in Roman law during the 500 year dominance of the Roman Empire. And it forms the basis of the modern capitalist economy. This absolute conception of ownership is taken for granted by most people today. The children making their first communions have absorbed it by the age of seven. It underpins the virus of rampant individualism, a virus which could just as validly be renamed selfish individualism. Ireland today is the 14th wealthiest country in the world, according to the IMF with 53,000 millionaires, 5,000 more than 12 months ago, and the fastest growing economy in the EU. But after three years of economic growth, we have a record number of homeless people, including 2,700 children. And recently, 12 homeless families had to spend the night on the streets as there was no emergency accommodation available for them, something we haven't seen in this country since the famine. We have lost our sense of outrage. The suggestion that an economic system which produces more inequality, exclusion and misery is a fundamentally immoral system is deleted by this virus of selfish individualism. Conservative parties in every country, including Ireland, propagate this virus as their membership and core constituency are predominantly the better off and the more successful, in inverted commas, in society. And this virus has contaminated the dominant spirituality of our churches. Our churches tell us that the primary objective of our life on earth is to get to heaven and that to get there, we must observe all the laws that God has laid down. The focus of this spirituality is on what I want and what I, on what I have to do in order to get what I want. A spirituality which is self-centered. The objective of such a self-centered spirituality may be spiritual and the path laudable, but it doesn't differ too much from someone whose objective is to make money and chooses to go to Trump University to learn how to do so. Except they at least got a refund for false advertising. <laughs> 
In this spirituality, we are all individuals walking side by side along the same road to heaven. Some will obey the rules, make the necessary sacrifices, and reach their goal. Others will give in to selfish here in our pleasures and will drop by the wayside. Spirituality of the Gospels, however, is a spirituality which is focused not on me and what I want, but on others and what they need. Remembering that I am my brother's keeper, Christians should be walking the path of self-giving, not spiritual self-seeking. Christian spirituality is based on communi community and solidarity, which is the exact opposite to selfish individualism. The last judgment scene in Matthew's Gospel, if you remember it, I was hungry and you gave me to eat, welcome into the kingdom, reminds us that we will ironically only get to heaven by forgetting about heaven and focusing our attention on this earth. In a perverse sort of way, selfish individualism has been transformed into a positive virtue. It is what grows the economy, what makes the world go round. Selfish individualism personalizes the problems of poverty, unemployment, and homelessness, describing them as the outcome of individual or family dysfunctionality, and ignoring the role that government policies and decisions play in shaping negative outcomes for people. The stigma that if you are homeless, there must be something wrong with you is widespread in Irish society today. One provincial town, <clears throat> when it was suggested that some homeless families could be relocated down the country, said, no way, they're not coming here. We don't want Dublin's homeless. And I felt like replying that they might lift the area up a little bit, but I resisted the temptation. <laughs> Anyone who has the slightest familiarity with people on the margins, such as homeless people or drug users, know that their plight is not predominantly a personal pathology. Homelessness today in Irish society has been caused primarily by government policy. Fifteen years ago, Government decided to abandon its responsibility to provide social housing and to transfer that responsibility to the private rented sector. In 1975, this country built 8,500 social houses. In 1985, when we were in the middle of another recession, we built 6,900 social houses. And in 2015, we built 75 social houses. That's the main reason why so many people today are homeless, not some personal pathology on their part. And homelessness continues because of the failure of government prop policy to adequately address escalating rents and to prevent banks and landlords from evicting people into homelessness so that they can secure a higher price when they sell the house. Government policies have created a dysfunctional housing system, and this is far more important in understanding homelessness today than any supposed defect or deficiency in homeless persons themselves. However, not all individualism can be called selfish individualism. Many people today, even when they care about the suffering of others, experience a great sense of powerlessness to do anything about it. I am constantly asked by people who are going to work that they pass the same person in the same doorway every morning, what can they do about it? The reality is there's very little they can do about it. They can give a donation to the Simon community, but the person will still be there in the morning the next day. They can write to their local TD, but the person will still be in the doorway tomorrow morning. So many feel, what's the point in getting upset by a problem about which I can do nothing? Instead, I'll focus on my own family, where I can do something and give them the best start in life that I can give them. 
it can appear to be a case of inward-looking selfishness. But in reality, it may sometimes be driven by a sense of powerlessness to address the needs of others. And compounding all this is the phenomenon of compassion fatigue. In this multimedia age, we are bombarded every day with images of suffering, images coming from every corner of the world. To preserve our sanity, we have to switch off. We cannot allow everyone's pain to become our pain. And so we tend to prevent anyone's pain from becoming our pain. The second value I'd like very quickly to mention, which is embedded in our culture and that militates against developing empathy, is that for the global economy to keep growing, we must be persuaded that it is in getting that our fulfillment is to be found. It's in purchasing and consuming that we find our happiness and our satisfaction. The bigger house, the newer model of care, the latest mobile phone, the foreign holiday, we are persuaded will make a major contribution to our happiness. Indeed, we come to be persuaded that these are essential. If our happiness is bound up with what we possess, then a primary objective of every human being in life is to accumulate the resources to purchase those goods and services, which we are convinced are necessary to our fulfillment. And so we're pushed into a competitive struggle with other human beings to accumulate the material benefits which we are led to believe will bring us happiness. Others become not the source of our fulfillment, but a threat to that fulfillment. Advertising, the heart that pumps the money through the system, is successful in selling the products it promotes to the extent that it succeeds in persuading us that these products are necessary to our success, our satisfaction. Have you been tempted by the latest Samsung S8 mobile phone with its, quote, stunning infinity display? Whatever that means, but it sounds great. <laughs> Perhaps you recall the advertisement. If you wanted to drive a Mercedes-Benz one day, that day is now. <laughs> and young people are particularly influenced by advertisements, and their sense of self-worth can be bound up with what they possess, with the brand name clothes, or the mobile phone model which they possess. Parents are under huge pressure from young people to purchase for them something that they've seen on television or that their friends possess. And of course, parents themselves may feed that value. Parents themselves are always trying to acquire something in the hope of having, uh, a, that that will bring them some satisfaction, then they are transmitting that value to their children unknowingly. But the irony and the contradiction of the capitalist economy is that while it must persuade us that acquiring something new is essential to our happiness, it actually depends on us becoming in time dissatisfied with what we have recently acquired, so that we feel the need to go out and purchase again. When I was growing up, there were only two types of television. There was a 14-inch black and white and a 17-inch black and white. <laughs> and we had a 17-inch black and white, and I was glued to it for hours on end, watching all the children's programs. Then I went to England on holidays, and I saw color television. <laughs> When I came back, I wanted a color television. How could you enjoy watching a football match on black and white television? Then we got a big television, 21 inch. Then we got a flat screen television. And many of you disposed of your old, perfectly good cathode ray tube TV in order to upgrade to a flat screen. Then it was a 32 inch high definition television. Then it became necessary to watch programs with billions of pixels on an ultra-high definition television. Then it was smart televisions. 
how could you possibly enjoy your evening at home if you do not have a 55-inch curved ultra-high definition <laughs> 4G smart television? Pursuing happiness through acquiring what I am led to believe will make me happy effectively shifts our focus from reaching out to others to ensuring that I have the wherewithal to purchase what I want. And finally, the third value that accompanies the economic system in which we are immersed is that it must be persuade us that our security is to be found in what we possess. Owning our own home, building up our bank balance, expanding our share capital are essential to escaping from the insecurity which the future threatens us with. It's also essential for the security of our children. <clears throat> Thus, the global economy enslaves us. We have got to work hard within the system in order to obtain more, in order to cushion ourselves and our families from the uncertainties of the future. If for any reason we drop out of the workforce, we and our family may drop into poverty and homelessness, as many have already found in the recession. But we are constantly reminded that this is not so, ironically, by the same economists. They remind us that the threat of higher interest rates could push many families who now enjoy a comfortable security into a debt from which they may not emerge. They discuss the conditions which could trigger another collapse in the housing market that could plunge many families who now enjoy a comfortable security into homelessness. So the more we have, the more we need to protect. There is a growing demand for burglar alarms guaranteed burglar-proof windows and doors, we have to encrypt our bank details on our computers, and the ultimate protection is to be found in gated communities where we keep people out. In other words, we have to keep people out if we want to retain what we have and thereby ensure our security. So we restrict our empathy, our reaching out, to those in our own family in our circle of friends, and in our own social class. Others, particularly those who have little, the poor, the homeless, the needy, come to be seen as potential threats to that security. So we become intolerant of difference. This is so evident in the response of many to refugees and immigrants. They are seen as a threat to the opportunities available to us in employment, housing, and health. They invade our comfort zones, and we resist, as is evident in the rise of right-wing nationalism in some countries of Europe, not to mention Donald. <laughs> Common sense today for many people means building walls, not bridges. It means keeping people out not reaching out. And ironically, while the church is rejected by many, and with good reason, given the appalling behavior of some of its priests and bishops and institutions, and is written off as not having a contribution to make to the lives of people, the values the Christian gospel espouses have the potentials to solve the ills of our world. Its emphasis on solidarity as opposed to individualism. Its emphasis on finding happiness and fulfillment in giving as opposed to getting. And its emphasis on finding security in community as opposed to our material assets are the foundations for building a world of justice, equality, and peace. Thank you very much.